Hey all, hi everybody, and welcome to this Google Hangout on how to shift from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Or as I called it, how to shift from scarcity to serenity. So today I'm gonna to be sharing five ideas with you, but first I'll just give a quick introduction to who I am, share a brief grounding exercise, and then we can get straight onto it. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you know that you will get the most out of this webinar if you have a pen and paper to hand. Whoops, excuse me, there is something playing in the background. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that is one of the hazards of doing a live event <laughs> is that you get random stuff playing in your browser in the background. <laughs> so um, as I was saying, uh, you'll get the most out of today if you take a couple of seconds just to grab a pen and paper or to open up a Google Doc or a new word processing document uh, because I'm going to be sharing a couple of exercises for you to do as we move through these five ideas and concepts and start them, start to put them into practice. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to go and do that right now while I have a sip of tea and then we will continue. Okay, so just to let you know as well, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, hopefully, if you are watching this live, you should be able to see in the right-hand side of your window a little app where you can ask questions. So what I'll invite you to do is if you have questions at any point during this, is just to type them in there. And then um, I will probably take a few moments at the end of each uh, idea I'm going to share to respond to any questions that have come up and if I miss them then for any reason um, I will get to them at the end And if I miss them then for any reason I will get in touch with you separately or create a post about it um, but I, I will answer them in some way so that feature is there for you to use fingers crossed I hope if I've done everything right <laughs> um, so please do feel free to ask any questions you have at any point so um, I'm assuming if you're on this Hangout, then you're probably a little bit familiar with me and what I do already. Uh, but if you're, not, hello, if you're not, hello, my name is Hannah Brame, and I'm the founder of a website called Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at becomingwhoyouare.net. Um, in a nutshell, I help people do things that are better for them, which basically means that I help people live with more authenticity and um, enjoy life and live their lives rather than living life according to somebody else or according to how they think they should live it. Um, but really go out there and feel the way they want to feel, do the things they want to do and really feel alive because what else is life for? So before we get going with the big ideas that I want to share today, I just want to guide you through a very brief grounding exercise. And I want to do this because we're all coming here today from different places, with different experiences, with different stuff on our minds and different emotions swirling around. Um, I don't know about you, but it's just past 7 p.m. here for me now, so I'm right at the end of my day. I'm aware that some of you might be halfway through your day, just getting started with your day. You might be watching this at a completely different time. So either way, um, what I wanna do is kind of bring us all together and bring us all onto the same plane so that we can make sure that we're approaching this from a similar place. So this exercise is really about calming. So to get started, I just want you to close your eyes and make sure your feet are flat on the floor and your hands are just resting in your lap. Obviously, if you're listening to this audio um, and you're doing something like driving or operating heavy machinery, please don't do that. Um, keep your eyes open, keep your hands where they need to be, <laughs> but just go with the flow of this and visualize as though that is what you're doing. So once you're there with your eyes closed, with your feet flat on the floor, nice and grounded, your hands resting in your lap, just take three really deep breaths in and out. Then once you've done that, just return your breathing to normal. 
And then as you're sitting there with your eyes closed, nice and relaxed, just breathing, just do a quick scan of your body for any tension that might be left over from other parts of your day. So really common areas we carry tension are our shoulders, our neck and our jaw. Our jaw is something that we don't often think about, but we, we tend to carry a lot of tension there without even really being conscious of it. Um, actually, the scalp is another place. We often think, how do you relax your scalp? But if you just shift your attention to that and really focus on relaxing it and just, you know, almost imagine that you're breathing in relaxation and breathing out all the tension and really shift your focus to your scalp, you will probably notice a very subtle shift in tension going on there. So do a quick scan of your whole body, but pay particular attention to those areas where we tend to carry tension. And then once you've done that, just take three more really deep breaths. So breathing in, nice deep breath, and then breathing out again. And then a second breath in. Often it feels really, really good, especially if you've been sitting down all day or if you've been rushing around, your attention's been elsewhere. It feels really good to just sit and breathe really, really deeply and get the oxygen flowing in and get all the carbon dioxide out. And so then just take a third deep breath, really fill up your lungs and then really empty them out afterwards. And then you can open your eyes. So here is a brief overview of five ideas that I'm going to share with you today. So these five ideas are going to be around the topic of shifting a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. So the first idea is that abundance is not about money, nor is it in fact about anything that we have. So that's the first idea. Abundance is not about money. The second idea is focus on what you're for rather than on what you're against. So that's focus on what you're for rather than what you're against. Third idea is instead of asking what can I get from this, ask what can I contribute? So instead of asking what can I get from this, ask what can I contribute? And the fourth idea is create a vision but don't get too attached to the goal. So let's create a vision, don't get too attached to the goal. And then the fifth and final idea is be the captain of your own ship. And this is potentially the most important idea, which is why I have saved it until last. So first idea, abundance is not about money. We often think about abundance in terms of stuff that we have. So money or uh, belongings, maybe, you know, fancy car, fancy house, um, maybe even sometimes in terms of partners, you know, how many friends do we have? Do we have a romantic partner or a husband and wife? Um, we tend to think about abundance in terms of those things, but actually abundance is not about, it's not about how much money you have and it's not even about what you have. Just a scarcity and a scarcity mindset is not about what you don't have. Both abundance and scarcity are about how we relate to what we have or we don't have. So that's a really, really important distinction there. It's not the facts of the matter itself, uh, themselves, it's how we relate to what we have or what we don't have. So as I was saying, it's not about how much money we have, where we live, how big our houses or our flats are, uh, whether we have you know, the latest iPhone 24 or whatever. It's about how we relate to how we feel and how we talk about what we do have. This is where things like the law of attraction kind of have a point. So I'm not generally a huge fan of the concept of the law of attraction as a whole, just because for me personally, it's a little bit woo-woo. Um, but like many movements in the personal development world, there are useful ideas that we can cherry pick and pay attention to in our own lives. So there's definitely some really golden nuggets of truth in there. And one of these nuggets and one of these ideas that I want to share with you today is the concept that what you put out, you get back. Or to put it another way, uh, what you sow, you reap. You know, there's that, um, that famous song by Lee Reed where the chorus goes, you're going to reap what you sow. And that's a really, really common phrase that we've all heard, we all know. Um, and it's kind of true as well in life to a certain extent. So what this means is that if we're constantly focusing on what we don't have, we're sowing seeds of lack and not enough. And that's exactly what we're going to get back. 
even when we get things that we think we initially wanted, uh, if we get them, we're still going to feel unhappy. And so we're going to look to the next goal to buoy us up. This starts a cycle that I call the when then mentality. And I call it this because the thoughts we usually have go something like, when I get that job, then I'll be happy. Or when I'm earning X, Y, Z amount of money, then I'll feel secure. Or when I finish this next big project, then I'll be able to take a break and spend time doing the things I really want to do. The problem with this mentality is that the goal we're chasing is not the thing that is actually going to make us happy. When we keep thinking in this way, we give away our potential for happiness, security, satisfaction, or whatever it is that we're wanting more of. And we give that away that potential to our hypothetical future selves. And we never get to experience it right now. Um, and I can tell you because I've had this mindset and I've lived this pattern out many times that we don't need to feel happy slash secure or satisfied, etc. when we reach that goal. We don't feel that way. Instead, what happens is that we get there, we realize that we don't feel happy, satisfied, secure, whatever it is we're chasing, we don't feel that way. And so we think, oh, well, that must be because I haven't achieved this next thing now. And so then we set our sights to the next thing. And it's just this constant hamster wheel of trying to, to grasp, to achieve, to attain, and so on. So that's just one way that we reap what we sow. Equally, if we're going out into the world with a negative mindset about where we're at right now, we're more likely attract, to attract people who share this mindset. If most of what we talk about is how things are going wrong for us, the problems that we're dealing with, and so on and so forth, we are more likely to attract people who have a similar mindset and can relate to that. We're also more potentially likely to deter people who are more optimistic, who take responsibility for their lives and take action on the things that they want to do. And ultimately, if you want to make change in your life, those are the kinds of people that you really want to be around because you want to be around people who are going to support you in taking action. Um, you're going to be, uh, you want to be around people who are going to encourage you to do that. And you're not going to want to be around people who are stuck. Like you don't really, it's not going to be super helpful for you to be around people who, you know, might even potentially feel a little bit threatened by you moving forward. So that's another way in which we reap what we sow is who we attract into our lives and the kinds of people that we end up surrounding ourselves with. So abundance is really a mindset. And although, you know, when we talk about shifting from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset, it might feel a little bit intangible and a little bit hard because it is a mindset. It's not something that we can practically touch or see or, you know, fiddle with ourselves, right, with our hands. Um, but actually, even though it can feel a little bit challenging, the fact that it's a mindset is a really, really good thing. It's really great news because it means that for all of us today, wherever we're at and whatever we're dealing with, we don't need to wait until that debt is paid off or until our income goes up or until we get a new boyfriend or girlfriend to start appreciating what we do have and to start enjoying that feeling of peace that comes with accepting where we are right now. So this is the first exercise that I want to share with you today. And if you missed the very beginning of this, um, I asked you just to take a couple of seconds to go grab a pen and paper. So if you haven't already done that, I really, really encourage you to go do that now. And when you have your pen and paper, um, just write down, take a few seconds and write down all of the uh, the thoughts you've had over the last couple of days or even the last week that follow that pattern of when I have this thing, then I will feel this desired feeling, you know, whether that's then I'll be happy, then I'll feel secure, then I'll be satisfied. And especially make a note of what areas of your life these types of thoughts frequently crop up in. So do you think that about money? Do you think, you know, when I uh, drop a couple of dress sizes, then I will feel happier? Do you think that when I can leave my job and I can get a new job, then I'll be happier? When I finish my degree, then I'll be happier? Um, what areas of your life do you usually have those thoughts around? So I'll just give you about 30 seconds to a minute to make a note of all the times recently when you've had those thoughts and think about the very specific areas of your life in which they regularly crop up.
Okay, so if you just finish whatever you're writing right now, um, you can very much carry this on later, but um, I'm going to speed things up a little bit here just because we have quite a limited amount of time this evening. Um, so now you have a few examples of where the thinking crops up for you. What I want you to do is just spend another 30 seconds or so thinking about how you can start to generate more of that feeling you want. So really focus on that feeling you want rather than uh, rather than the first part of the sentence, focus on the second part of the sentence. So focus on you know, whether it's happiness, whether it's satisfaction, whether it's fulfillment, security, all those things that are very, very human things to want that we all, all want in life. Um, focus on what, what those things are and how you can start to generate more of that feeling you want. You might find that there are certain things you have today that you're actually overlooking because you're focusing on tomorrow or you're focused on the activity that you think is going to get you there. Or it might be that you don't even need to meet those goals in order to get those feelings that you want to feel. Uh, it might be that those feelings are actually accessible to you regardless of whether you ach achieve or attain that thing um, or you know, whatever you're doing right now. So really focus on the feelings and almost brainstorm a list of ways that you can start to generate that feeling today without necessarily having to wait until you change something about yourself, until you achieve this big hairy goal that you have. Um, but how can you start to feel that way today? So I'll just give you another 30 seconds or so to do that and then we will move on. Okay, so if you can just finish whatever sentence you are writing right now. Uh, as I said, this is an exercise I very, very much encourage you to build on in your own time, to really work through all of those thoughts you're having or that fit the template of when I have X, then I will feel Y. Um, but as I said, because we have quite a limited amount of time tonight, I'm going to move on to the next few steps now. Um, I just had a look to see if anyone had any questions. It doesn't look like anybody does, but if you do, like I said, feel free to drop them in the chat box that hopefully you can all see on the right-hand side of this window, of the video window. Um, so yeah, if you, I'm gonna move on to the next point now, but if you have questions, drop them in and I will get to them as soon as I can. So the next big idea that I'm gonna share with you this evening is focus on what you're for rather than on what you're against. So that's focus on what you're for rather than on what you're against. When people talk about an abundance versus scarcity mindset, they often encourage others to focus on what they have rather than what they don't have. With this idea, I'm just gonna take this a small step further today and invite you to focus on what you're for rather than on what you're against. And this is subtly different from focusing on what we have rather than on what we don't have, as it encourages to approach our thoughts about the future from an optimistic place, rather than just looking at what we have in the present. So for me personally, when I think about focusing on what I'm for rather than what I'm against, um, that encompasses the present and the future rather than just focusing on what I have right now versus what I don't have. If we constantly do things because we're motivated by wanting to avoid pain, we're always going to be focusing on the pain in our lives. As I said earlier, you know, what we put out, we attract, what we sow, we end up reaping later on. And so if we are focusing um, on doing things, if we're primarily motivated by wanting to avoid pain, um, the chances are we're going to end up causing ourselves more pain. Obviously, that's not our intention, but that is usually the way it works out, just because our focus is on that pain in the first place. 
If, however, we start to do things because we know that these things will bring us pleasure and enhance our lives in some way, we're coming at these activities from a place of having enough already. And we're far more likely to enjoy the process of doing these things as a result. Exercise is a great example of this. I don't know about you, but whenever I've exercised because I feel like I'm not enough, so I'm not skinny enough, I'm not fit enough, you know, and I end up comparing myself to other people and come from that place of lacking, um, it never works. I never, ever stick with it. I might start out with great intentions, but after a while, I know that I end up resenting the process. Uh, I end up feeling frustrated that I'm not making as much progress as quickly as I might like. And therefore, um, I still feel not enough, even though I'm expending a lot of effort and energy I'm putting into it. And what that means is that eventually it creates this vicious cycle where I keep feeling not enough, I keep feeling not enough, I keep having these expectations of myself and not meeting them, and eventually I give up. So I don't know about you, that's something that I used to experience a lot. If I focus on how I want to feel, however, so in other words, if I exercise out of emotion, out of motivation to move towards pleasure rather than out of a motivation to move, to, move away from pain, um, I'm a lot more likely to stick with it because then my focus is on, well, I'm going to do this because I really want to feel good. Like I know that I'll feel great afterwards. It might not be super comfortable in the meantime, but I know that when I'm done, I will feel really proud of myself. I'll feel really good about what, I, what I've achieved, you know, what I've done, the fact that I've taken care of myself. You know, over time, I'll get to see my fitness level change. I might even get to see my body change. But I'm not thinking about it from a place of like, oh, I'm just not good enough as I am. And that's why I need to do this. I'm thinking about it from a place of potential and possibility. So I hope that makes sense. It's quite a subtle distinction, this idea of are you moving away from pain or are you moving towards pleasure? But it has such a profound impact on what our experience of that process is. You know, our, that process of moving, as I'm talking about it in the abstract right now, that is our daily lives. That is, you know, the decisions that we make each day. That is the, the way we spend our time on a day-to-day -day basis. So the process is super, super important. So for this idea, I'd encourage you to pick up your pens again and just write down these questions. Um, so the first question is, where in your life are you focusing on what you're against? And then the follow-up question to that one is, what would it look like to shift that focus towards what you're for instead? So what would you do differently? And as a result of shifting that focus away from what you're against and towards what you're for, uh, how might that shift how you feel as well, how you feel about that particular activity or that particular area of your life? So I'll just read those questions out again to make sure you've had time to scribble them down. So the first question is, where in your life are you focusing on what you're against? And the second question is, what would it look like to shift that focus towards what you're for instead? What would you do differently if that were the case? And how would you feel if you were to make that shift from focusing on what you're against to focusing on what you're for? I'll just check for any questions very quickly. Doesn't look like we have any questions. We have a few people who have jumped on, however. So hello, everybody who um, might have missed the very beginning. Um, I'm just about to move on to the third idea out of five that I'm sharing today. But if you've missed any of this, you can absolutely, once it's done, you can just go back and click play, and you'll be able to see the first few bits. So the third idea I'm going to share is instead of asking, what can I get from this, ask, what can I contribute? This shift is probably the idea that has had the single biggest impact on how I relate to what is happening in my life and situations that I find myself in, especially during times when things aren't quite going the way I want them to or expected them to. Um, and I notice thoughts around uh, not enough creeping in about myself, my work, and the rest of my life. So I'm not doing enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not achieving enough. Um, 
I, I still get those thoughts sometimes. I'm not sure it's necessarily realistic to expect ourselves to eradicate those thoughts completely. Um, but as I've said at the very beginning, you know, scarcity versus abundance mindset is not about what we have or don't have. It's about how we relate to what we have or don't have. So if you're also in a position where you still find those thoughts creeping in sometimes, those thoughts of not enough, hopefully this idea would be really helpful for how you relate to those thoughts as well. So this idea of focusing on what I can contribute instead of what I can get from a situation was a real aha moment for me because in some ways it is so counterintuitive. I mean, why if we're feeling like we don't have enough when we focus on what we can contribute and on what we can give? Um, surely we'd be looking out to get what we're needing, right? I mean, that just makes sense. If we feel like we don't have enough, of course our focus is going to be on getting the things that we do need and sort of plugging that gap that we, we perceive that we have or rather than giving more out. That's certainly the default position that we go to and it's a very, very natural, very human position. If you've heard the podcast interview I did with Guy Winch, uh, which you can find at episode 49 of the Becoming Who You Are podcast, you might remember that Guy mentioned at one point that studies of the human brain have shown that when we experience rejection, it lights up the same parts of our brain that light up when we experience physical pain. So although it doesn't feel to us physically like physical pain, it still triggers those same neural reactions in our brain. It still has that same effect on us. It still lights up the same parts of our brain as light up when we experience uh, physical pain. So it's a really intense, really uncomfortable experience. So thinking back to the last point we talked about, if we're in a scarcity mindset and we're feeling rejected or alienated from other people as a result of that, we're going to be focused on moving away from pain rather than moving towards pleasure. Hence, we're going to be asking, what can I get from this? You know, I'm, I'm feeling pain right now. How can I alleviate this pain? How can I get something to take this pain away? In reality, however, the way that the world works is that we get value and we get things by giving value and giving things. That is the way the world works um, in business, in relationships, and in most, if not all, areas of life. If you think about friendships, our friends are our friends because they get value from our presence, just as we get value from theirs, and that's why we are their friends, right? There's a definite, you know, in healthy friendships, there's a definite give and take and reciprocity. <clears throat> Equally with um, work and with money, you know, we earn money at a specific company or through performing specific services or tasks because those roles, services or tasks are valuable to someone else. So we are giving them value and we are getting value back in return. Although focusing on what we can get from a certain situation is very natural, it's unlikely to get us anywhere as when we're in this mindset, we're focused on taking rather than giving. So again, I want you to invite you to think of a situation recently where you noticed you went in focusing on what you could get from that situation. Pick up your pen and paper again or open up your little work document and just take a few seconds to write it down and write a little about the circumstances. And then when you've done that, just spend some time, probably about 30 seconds uh, is what we've got time for this evening, so not very long, I'm afraid. But um, hopefully it will give you the gist of this so you can continue, continue this exercise afterwards. Just write a few sentences about what you would have done differently if you had focused on what you could contribute instead of what you can get. So you're taking that situation that's already happened where you were focused more on what you could get rather than what you could give. Um, or what you could contribute, and you're turning it around. So you're, you're practicing mentally, thinking about opportunities where you can contribute. And remember that this isn't about money. So it's not about if you don't have any money, the way to get more money is giving money to other people. Um, I totally don't believe in that. I don't think that's at all responsible <laughs> um, or sensible or helpful for you to do. So remember that abundance and scarcity is not about what we have or don't have, it's about how we relate to things. There's many, many, many ways of contributing that don't remotely involve money. So I really want to make that clear because often when we think about giving, um, the first thing that pops up into my head anyway is giving to charity, uh, money stuff. Maybe that's just me. 
but um, I think it's really, really important to remember that contribution um, is usually not anything to do with money. It can be something completely different. There are so, so, so many ways that you can contribute and give that don't involve uh, anything to do with money or finances or anything like that. So when you've got those two scenarios, when you've got the initial scenario where you were focused on um, getting, I nearly said giving there, <laughs> that would have been confusing. When you've got the first scenario, when you're focused on getting, and then the second scenario, when you're focused on contributing and what you can contribute, notice how that second scenario feels. You know, notice the difference between when you read through those scenarios, how do they feel different uh, to you? I know that when I've done this exercise in the past, I noticed that the latter scenario, um, although it's a different way of thinking for me, it usually really feels like a relief. It feels lighter, it feels easier, and ultimately it feels more aligned with how I want to show up in the world. So like I said, that was a whirlwind tour through that exercise. I'd really encourage you to build on this after the webinar is over and use that switch around whenever you notice that you're putting your energy and your focus into what you can get from a certain situation rather than approaching it from that place of uh, needing more, of lacking, uh, rather than focusing on what you can contribute and what you have to offer in that situation too. So uh, the penultimate idea I'm going to share with you tonight, and that is idea number four, is create a vision, but don't get too attached to the goal. But before we get onto that, I'm just going to take a quick look for any questions. Um, doesn't look like we have any. Nope. Okay, that's good. And I'm going to have a quick sip of tea. <laughs> Okay, so idea number four, create a vision, but don't get too attached to the goal. So this is another big idea that I have found super useful in my life. I used to set goals and get really attached to meeting them, so attached to the actual achievement or outcome. And what I would find would happen when I did that is that some goals I'd meet, that would be great, um, usually when I was in this mindset, I would then fall into the, the uh, when I have X, then I'll feel Y trapped. So then, you know, I would get to that goal, I'd meet it, and I find that actually I wasn't happy or, you know, satisfied or whatever it was I was chasing at that particular time. And then I set my sights immediately on the next goal without, you know, really taking time to celebrate the fact that I've met the goal. So that was the one slight downfall of this particular method of goal setting that I used to use. Um, where I was focusing purely on the achievement and the outcome of the goal. Um, with goals that I didn't meet, however, what I used to find is that I would start focusing on the fact that I wasn't there yet. And I would start really dwelling on, oh, I'm so far from this goal, like I've got such a long way to go, and all these thoughts like that. And again, you know, if you've been um, listening to this webinar from the beginning, you'll notice that I'm very much placing my attention in like quite a negative place and quite a kind of lacking and not enough place to thinking that way. So I was doing all that rather than enjoying the process of reaching that goal and being able to look at how far I had come. And that definitely, definitely affected um, not only my ability to reach the goal, because ultimately I ended up getting kind of demotivated, feeling kind of bad about myself, and usually would just stop trying to meet that goal that I had set. Um, but it also made the process of reaching that goal kind of stressful uh, because I was constantly focusing on what I wasn't doing well enough or how far I had to go rather than things like how far I had come and how well I was doing. Like I mentioned earlier, we want to focus on what we're for. And this includes creating a future vision for ourselves and creating goals or milestones we'd like to reach. So I absolutely don't think there's anything wrong with uh, creating goals. In fact, I think it's super, super helpful. Um, the way I talk about it with clients is like you want to create goals because otherwise it's like leaving the house and getting in your car and starting to drive without having any idea of where you're going. Um, some people love that. I personally like to have an idea of where I'm going just because it really helps me make, I feel, I feel like it helps me make the most out of my life, helps me make the most out of my time, and it helps me live in a purposeful way, which is something that is really, really important, and a conscious way too, which is something else that is really important to me. 
So it's not about not creating goals. It's perfectly, perfectly okay to create goals. When we are creating these goals, however, it's really, really important to start by focusing on how we want to feel and then creating goals out of those desired feelings. So it's not about the actual goal itself. The foundation for any goal we create for ourselves in life is, okay, how do I want to feel, first of all, just generally in my life? How do you want to feel? And then once we know how we want to feel, that is the foundation for going forward and saying, okay, well, what goals will help me meet, what, what goals will help me create that feeling in my life? Um, if you're interested in exploring this process and this framework in more depth, by the way, I really, really recommend checking out the book, The Desire Map by Danielle Laporte, because it goes, she basically created this whole framework and it goes into that into a lot more detail and offers several really, really helpful exercises that you can do as well. So we all know <clears throat> on an intellectual level, I know it, I'm sure you know it too, that doing things because we want to impress other people is not a good plan. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't make us happy. Um, so focusing on how we want to feel and pursuing the activities that will generate those feelings for us is a much, much healthier alternative to this. When we approach goals in this way, the goal itself doesn't matter. It's the process that really, really counts. And that's why this idea is about creating a vision, but not getting too attached to the goal. So we're creating a vision, we're creating a vision of the process, we're not getting super attached to the outcome, however. When we get attached to goals, our happiness becomes dictated by whether we've met that said goal or not. In other words, we make that goal way more powerful than it actually is, and the goal starts controlling us rather than the other way around. In reality, uh, we can shift goals as and when we need to. So this is not the same as giving up. It's not the same as dropping out or um, self-sabotaging or anything. I'm talking about genuine times when we start working towards a goal. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had this plenty of times when I start working towards a goal and I found that new opportunities have come up as a result of the progress that I've made so far. So, you know, maybe new opportunities that might take me off in a slight tangent from where, what my original goal was, but towards something that ultimately is bigger and brighter and way more aligned with what I want to be doing and how I want to be spending my time. And we might also notice that uh, or realize that um, the thing I thought was the goal in the first place isn't actually what I wanted to be doing. And that's something that is perfectly okay. And it's okay to be able to give ourselves that flexibility to say, okay, I'm going to shift my goalpost now then. Being, on the, being focused on the process rather than the goal and keeping in mind that the ultimate end goal of how I want to feel, um, prioritizing that end goal of how we want to feel rather than the outcome of the goal itself. So rather than focusing on what we want to attain or achieve, this allows us to be way more flexible, as I said. So instead of approaching the goal from a place of not having enough, and again, you know, going back to that framework of like when I have X, Y, Z, when I have that degree, when I have that postgraduate, you know, PhD or whatever, then I'll feel happy. Um, rather than approaching goals from that perspective and that perspective of not having enough or not being enough, um, when we focus on how we want to feel, we are approaching goals from a place of just wanting life to be awesome and wanting to feel good and to be happy and to feel satisfied and to know that we are spending time on things that are really, really important to us. And that is what goals are all about. So fourth exercise for this evening. Uh, right now, I want you to put thoughts about all the goals you currently have in your life to one side. So shelf them just for the next couple of minutes. And instead, I just want you to take 30 seconds or so again to write down three to five words that describe how you want to feel. So as you're doing this, try to be as specific as possible. So instead of writing down something like, I want to feel happy, um, just because happy means different things to different people. Um, and often when we say we want to be happy, we don't mean happy, happy. We usually mean something that's more like satisfied or fulfilled or contented or peaceful. Um, so try to dig a little deeper and identify what those big, those big emotion words mean to you. So as I said, do you mean fulfilled, uh, contented, peaceful? 
Do you mean joyous? Do you mean inspired, excited or something else completely? But yeah, just take 30 seconds and try and really dig deep and get to the real, the core feelings that are underneath um, what you want to achieve in your life. Okay, so now that you have those list of words, I just want you to hold on to them. And after this webinar is over, just spend some time thinking about which goals, when you start working towards them, will leave you feeling that way. So remember, it's not even about the outcome of the goal itself, it's about the process of meeting that goal. What process is gonna help you feel that way? This will set you up to focus on your goals from a place of abundance and seeking pleasure, rather than from a place of not having enough or not being enough. So hold on to that list and then when you have more time after we finish this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're around the world, um, just take a several minutes to really work out for yourself you know, what processes are uh, working towards which goals are gonna help me feel that way. So moving on to the final idea for today, and this is, as I said at the beginning, potentially the most important idea. And that is, you are the captain of your own ship. So the final idea I want to share with you today is one that underpins pretty much everything that we have talked about so far. And that is the idea of self-responsibility. When we're operating from a scarcity mindset, we tend to focus on placing blame. We want to hold someone accountable for where we are and how we feel right now. And that is where a lot of our energy goes. This might be someone else. We might blame our parents, our boss, our partners, or anyone else in our lives for things that have happened to us or the things that we're struggling with right now. Um, sometimes something I hear frequently as a coach is, oh, I would love to do um, X, Y, Z. I'd love to you know, start my own business or do this with my life or move, etc. cetera. Um, but my, my mother or my father or my sister or my brother, husband, wife, friend doesn't support me. So I can't do this thing because I don't have their support. That's something that I hear a lot. Um, another thing that I hear a lot is that we blame ourselves and we say things like, I would love to do this thing, I'd love to do X, Y, Z, but I'm just not confident enough or I'm too old or I'm not skilled enough. To be blunt, when we say these things, we are making excuses for not going after the things that we really want to do. Um, we are either blaming ourselves or we're blaming someone else without focusing on creating a different situation in our lives. Blame is not productive and it moves us in the opposite direction to experiencing and living abundance. Wherever you are in life and however you feel about it, it might not be your fault that you are where you are right now. So it could totally be due to somebody else's decisions or actions that you're in the situation that you're in or that you, you're left feeling like you have limited options or you can't necessarily do or have some of the things you want to do or have. But the really, really, really important thing to remember above all else is that you have responsibility for what happens next. So whatever has happened in the past, you have responsibility for what happens next. No one else has control over ourselves and giving other people this control, either by blaming someone else for the fact that we're not feeling fulfilled or by waiting for someone to rescue us is a sure far way to slip into the scarcity mindset. I always think this question sounds a little bit cheesy, but it's an important question to ask. Where are you giving away your power? So where are you giving away your power to someone else? Or where are you telling yourself, I couldn't do that? Instead of asking yourself, how could I do that? 
A question I'd love you to consider is, where can I take responsibility for my life? Where am I giving someone else, my power, uh, someone else power over my life, either by blaming them for the way things are now or by waiting for them to rescue me? And what would I do differently if I were to start acting more like the captain of my ship? So these are questions that, um, just because I'm aware of time, I'd love you to write down and ponder a little bit later. Maybe you can journal on them. Um, maybe it's something if you have a coach or a therapist, you can kind of talk to them about it. Um, or a good friend that you trust who is sort of open to having these kinds of conversations. Um, but I'll, I'll just give you these questions again so you can make a note of them and shelve them till later. So the first question is, where can I take more responsibility for my life? It's where, where can I take more responsibility for my life? The second question is, where am I giving someone else power over my life? Either by blaming them for the way things are now or by waiting for them to rescue me. So that's, where am I giving somebody else power over my life? Either by blaming them for the way things are now or by waiting for them to rescue me. And then the third question, and probably the most important question out of all of these, is what would I do differently if I were to start acting more like the captain of my ship? So that's what would I do differently if I were to start acting more like the captain of my ship? These are not easy questions to answer, but they are an absolute must if we want to shift from scarcity-based thinking and live with the knowledge that this is our life. This is our life, and we absolutely have the power to make decisions that lead to greater abundance, greater satisfaction, greater fulfillment, and ultimately, the big H, greater happiness. So that is it for the ideas that I want to share today. We have a few minutes at the end, so I'm going to put out a last call for questions. I'm just going to do a quick check and see if anybody has posted any. Um, if for some reason you have been posting them, this did actually happen last time where I thought we had no questions, and then somebody emailed me afterwards or a couple of people said actually you know I was posting questions <laughs> and I just couldn't see them um, I'm still getting used to the whole Google Hangout format and exactly how it works so if you have been posting questions and I'm sitting here saying oh we didn't see any questions um, please feel free to email me and I will get back to you um, or simply you can go back onto the event page after this is over and post them there and I will see them pop up um, so please bear with me just for two seconds. Okay, so um, doesn't look like there is anything. So um, just to wrap up, you know, this is a really, really huge topic. So there's a lot more that I could say about it, but um, as I wrote about yesterday on the blog, sometimes less is more. <laughs> and I think with all of these big ideas that we that we talk about, you know, in personal development, when we're thinking about growth and thinking about ways in which we might want to shift our perspective or change the way we live our lives and relate to the world. Um, I'm a big believer in the idea that tackling these big juicy topics in small doses allows the information to sink in and it allows us to take action on the things that we've already covered without getting totally overwhelmed, confused and inundated with all this all this stuff. So if you would like to hear more about this topic, please let me know. I'm, I'm definitely open to doing another webinar on this at some point or sharing more content on the blog or on the podcast around this subject. Um, equally, if you have any questions, feel free to post them on the Hangout page. Um, these are questions after the event. Or you can email me and uh, I can be found at Hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Um, if you don't remember that, you can also go to becomingyouare.net and I have a nifty little thing on the toolbar, uh, the menu at the top of the page, it says contact and you can also reach me through there. So I love questions, feel free to send them my way or if you have any other thoughts about this webinar, um, any, any feedback at all, I would love to hear that too. So if you're feeling inspired to take any of these ideas further after hearing this and reap the benefits of adopting an abundance mindset in your own life, I would love to support you in a more in-depth and long-term way. I currently have two spots open in my coaching practice this month. So if you're ready to make some powerful changes in your own life, you can just drop me an email and we can set up a complimentary session to see if we are a good fit together. 
So that is something to bear in mind. Um, most of all, though, thank you so much for coming along to this Hangout today. I appreciate you taking the time to join me live if you have done that. And if not, if you're watching this afterwards, I really appreciate you taking the time to do that as well. And I hope you've enjoyed it and that it's given you some tools and ideas you can start to use to shift to an abundance mindset in your life. So thanks a lot for watching again, and I will see you very soon. Oh, actually, I have found a question. So let's just, a few minutes at the end, let's uh, answer this question from Rachel. Rachel says, um, that is an enormous teacup. Yes, it is, Rachel. And the <laughs> it, there's a very good reason for that. That's one of my favorite teacups because it is so big. Um, I'm a big fan of herbal tea. And um, I don't know what it's like where you're in the world right now, but we have definitely hit autumn here right now. And it's raining and it's windy. It's like gale, force winds, and thunder, lightning, and everything. So I have been really been enjoying my big cups of tea recently. So Rachel says, uh, what are the components to a future vision? And how do you analyze how things make us feel and try to maximize those things? Um, okay, so I'll split that question into two. So first of all, the components to a future vision. Again, with a future vision, I really like to start with, how do I want to feel in the future? Um, I, I did the design map process that I talked about, that book by Daniel Laporte for the first time at the beginning of this year. And I found it really, really helpful for mapping out or starting to map out, you know, what do I want to do? Often when people talk about creating future visions, they talk about focusing on, you know, where do you want to be? Who do you want to be with? Um, but I really encourage you to go back and start by focusing on, okay, how do I want to feel? And then once you have that, um, that idea of, you know, how do I want to feel? Once you have those words down, um, then you can um, then you can start to fill in the details. So then you can start to think about, well, who do I have in my life that really helps me feel that way? And if I don't have that many people, where can I find more people that will help me feel that way? What qualities will those people have? Um, so that in that way, you're creating that future vision of, you know, who do I want to surround myself with? What kind of a community do I want to have around me? Um, another thing to think about is what places help me feel that way. Uh, you know, we all tend to have our favorite places, whether that's by the beach or um, in a very cozy home. Uh, you know, there's those kinds of things. We all have preferences for that. And those, even though they're sort of maybe seemingly superficial preferences, they're really important to pay attention to because they will also help us um, meet those desired feelings that we have. Um, so as well as who we want to spend our time with, where we want to be. Um, other things to think about are how do we want to spend our time? You know, what are the things that really light us up? What do we love to do? Um, how do we want to treat ourselves as well? Um, what kind of relationship do we want to have with ourselves? The, these are all kind of things that we can think about. Um, as far as components go, there, there really is no limit. Um, what I would invite you to do, Rachel, is to think, you know, what, what components are really, really important to me? So, it, you know, different people have different preferences. Again, some people, it's really, really important to them where they're living, what their environment is like. Other people, um, environment is still important, but it's less important than relationships um, or it's less important than what they're spending their time on. So think about in your current life at the moment, what is really, really important to you? You know, what, what are the, uh, what is the list of deal breakers? You know, the things that you absolutely need in your life and what, what falls under the would be nice to have, but is not a hundred percent necessary list. Um, if you have any further questions about if you want to go into any more detail about what you mean by components, then feel free to um, post on the question in the chat. Um, but as far as mapping out those components, the most useful way that I found to do that is through journaling. If you're literally sitting down, uh, maybe set aside half an hour or an hour or even more, um, go somewhere nice, take your journal, and just really get yourself into the space. Um, you can even use the very, very brief meditation that I shared earlier. Get yourself into a space where you you're calm, you're relaxed, and you can approach this future vision from a place of abundance, like we've been talking about today, but also from a place of real internal peace and sort of, you know, a place that allows you to really tap into your intuition. 
Um, so the second part of your question was how do you do you have to analyze and do you have to analyze how things make us feel and try to maximize those things? Um, I think you are referring to that's something I talked about earlier. I think you're referring to the same idea with that question. Um, so I think I think, Rachel, what you mean, and I might be wrong about this, but I think what you mean is, do you have to analyze how things make us feel in the present and try to maximize those things? Um, if that is what you mean, that's great. If not, again, please feel free to correct me. Um, hopefully you'll see your question. If not, feel free to email me, but I'm just gonna roll with that right now. So um, analyzing how things feel in the present and trying how things make us feel and trying to maximize those things. That can definitely be helpful. Um, in terms of creating a future vision, obviously if there's something that's in your life right now that is not serving you, that is not really aligned with your values um, or the way that you want to live your life, that's really, really important to know um, because you probably don't want to include that in your future vision. Um, so definitely I would encourage you to maximize maximize the things that are aligned with your values and um, this is where self-knowledge and sort of really basic kind of self-knowledge 101 stuff comes in um, there are two particular uh, practices that I ask all of my clients to do the first thing is to work out what your values are so what your core values are and these are usually sort of quite um, general principles or qualities um, like my some of my core values are growth connection uh, freedom, things like that. You know, they're quite intangible qualities, but they are ultimately qualities that will really influence the decisions we make, how we live our lives, how we show up, the kind of things that we spend our time on, the kind of people we spend our time with, and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing that I encourage everybody to do. The second thing is to focus on um, building a list of what I call non-negotiables. So these are the activities that we need to do every day in order to feel like the best version of ourselves. And this, for you, Rachel, might be part of developing your future vision, is working out, okay, what activities really light me up? You know, what activities really leave me feeling inspired? Um, again, to give you some personal examples, some of mine are um, journaling. It's a really big one for me. Um, I also feel great after I exercise, after I go outside, um, because I work from home, <laughs> that is something that I have to be really conscious about, is actually getting out and uh, going for a walk each day. Um, meditation is another one for me. Um, that's something that I, I find, I know that when I do that on a regular basis, I just feel way, way more um, calm, way more confident, way more centered in myself and connected to myself. Um, so I hope I'm answering your question with this. I'm not 100% sure if I got the correct gist of your question in the first place. It's always a little bit hard through text. Um, but as far as analyzing how things make us feel and trying to maximize those things, the very brief answer is yes. <laughs> I, uh, I hope you find those ideas that I shared helpful. Um, but yeah, it can be very, very helpful to, or it is very, very helpful to look in the present at what things are really serving you, you know, what things really light you up, what things make you feel great, um, and especially the things that leave you, um, that generate those feelings that you're wanting in the future, what the things that generate them now, how can you include more of those things in your life? So again, we're focusing on adding things, on um, devoting more time and more energy and attention to what makes us feel good, rather than you know moving towards pleasure basically rather than moving away from pain and thinking oh how can i get rid of this thing that is not serving me um so yeah i hope that makes sense rachel if you do have any more questions feel free to pop them in the question box i'm just going to do one last check and see if there are any other questions and if not um it's 8 p.m here so i am going to call that a night for tonight Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any further questions right now. So I'm going to say thank you once again. And I look forward to talking to you hopefully at the next hangout, which will be in November. 
So take care, have a lovely day, have a lovely evening wherever you are, and I will see you again soon. Bye.